Right. Let's turn the page here to unionization <laughs> in the United States, uh, galloping forward in a number of places, this time at YouTube. We are very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Katie Marie Marshner, who is a member organizer for the Alphabet Workers Union, Communi Communications Workers of America, Local 9009. Katie, thanks so much for being with us. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here with us. And and I mean, I, I think some people certainly saw this story towards the end of last month. Um, YouTube music workers, 41 to zero, voted to unionize. Um, talk to us about, you know, who are the YouTube music workers? What are they doing? And why did they want to, to, to unionize in the first place? And well, maybe give us that framework. <laughs> sure. Um, I think it's important to, I guess, start with uh, distinguishing ourselves from full-time Google employees. Um, our group that unionized is actually a group of subcontractors through a, comp a company called Cognizant. Um, and that's like a very uh, typical model for large tech companies. Um, they have their full-time employees. I think we see a lot of what their work places look like big lavish offices in downtown um, of, you know, really nice and desirable cities. But there's like a whole shadow workforce um, that these companies also utilize. Um, and they're in the form of subcontractors, temporary, wonder, uh, temporary workers and vendors. Um, and I fall into that category. So we are um, a pretty hidden workforce. Um, I think it's really easy when you use these types of platforms like uh, Spotify or YouTube Music, um, Netflix, anything like that, um, to just think that these things kind of run on their own, like some developer designs them and then they, they just kind of run. But there's actually like a group of, you know, hidden <laughs> workers that are ensuring that you receive the highest quality product possible. Um, so we fall into that group. Uh, we decided to unionize um, because we learned that there was a union that we could join. So we were reached out to um, by a full-time employee just letting us know like there's a union and temporary vendor and contract workers are allowed to join it. Uh, so we started attending meetings, um, started hearing about other issues that people were unionizing around and realized pretty quickly on that we had a really good case. Um, we had some issues around pay. Um, we, we were all hired remotely um, during the pandemic. There were only about eight people who ever worked in a physical office. And then the team grew to about 68 over the course of the pandemic. And we were starting to get, uh, you know, whispers about a, a return to office. And for most of us, we are not making enough for a commute to be feasible. Um, the office is located on the outskirts of Austin, pretty far away from where most people live. If you live in Austin, um, you know, there's the issue of childcare, all those types of things. Um, it just wouldn't be feasible. In addition to that, we also have about 20% of our workforce just entirely living outside of Austin. So mm. either in surrounding areas in Texas, maybe they were hired out of state in Florida or in California. And the company basically said, if you don't return on this date, um, you are abandoning your job. So uh, we decided that we needed to form a union to protect our uh, our positions and to just have a say in these types of like major, major decisions that would impact our livelihoods. And when it comes to labor victories like this, it's obviously fantastic for the workers that are immediately impacted. But does this also maybe have a spillover positive benefit for like tech workers in general? Um, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we heard, we certainly hope so. Like, um, I think for a long time, people think of tech workers as, um, you know, financially stable, you know, again, working in really cool offices and in exciting environments, but we've seen the mass layoffs at Google and at other giant tech companies. And we know that the landscape is shifting. Um, like even Google announced that their workers were expected to share desks, you know, mm. there's just little things like basic dignity, having your own space, having your own personal effects on your desk. Um, so yeah, I think we certainly hope that more people are inspired to unionize um, 
specifically the TVCs, the temporary vendor and contract workers, um, they are given less benefits, <laughs> you know, their pay is significantly less. Um, they're kind of, it's, it's a two-tiered system entirely. And we hope that um, our case inspires them. Uh, we did win a joint employer status. So we were able to, to prove to the NLRB, uh, the National Labor Relations Board, that Google is also an employer of us. And so we really hope that this is precedent setting and that people are inspired to follow suit and to uh, establish these massive tech companies as their employer and to be able to bargain with them as well. Mm. No, I mean, I think that's critically important, especially the joint employer rule. I mean, it has a big impact on everyone. I was, you know, people who don't know this is McDonald's workers, same thing. You know, I mean, there are all these big corporations that are trying to pretend they don't actually employ you however they can, so they don't have to actually find anything. And it seems like this is, and I think you're speaking to it to a degree. I mean, really, the the reality versus the 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 hype of of the tech industry. I mean, it seems to me that you know the issue of de-skilling, the role of AI, the use of contractors, um, you know, the abuse of the immigration system. I mean, that in many ways these are actually some of the worst employers. I mean, I even remember I had a friend who worked at a tech company and actually like paid pretty well, and they were saying to me like, "Oh, you know, I'm always here because we have this, we have that." And I was like, "How long are you working every week?" And they were like, "Oh, like 90 hours." And I thought like, oh, well, it sounds good because they're like, they have like a ball pit there. But then you realize, well, wait a second, they're actually taking almost your entire life. So it almost feels like the, the thing that I really appreciate about this win is it helps pull back the veil on, you know, these big companies that I think many people feel are like, they're not the Fords, they're not the GMs, they're not these like evil employers of the past. Yeah, totally. I think social media, it's really easy to think like, wow, what a cool company. Look at this office. There's massage tables and free kombucha. But yeah, those are historically traps to get people to not leave, to not take a lunch. We, we'll give you lunch. You stay at your desk, you eat, you don't leave. Um, it's, it's all like kind of just a veil of like, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll squeeze more labor out of you if we just give you these small concessions. And in reality, you know, there's so many studies that show people are more productive at home, uh, their mental health is better, which helps you be a better worker. Um, we don't need these offices and we don't need free kombucha. We just need a living wage and freedom and flexibility and, and a say, just a say, mm -hmm. like a, a, my life should not change because of the stroke of a billionaire's pen, you know, and that's just the bottom line. Like I've, I've been a good employee. I have worked my way up through the small ladder that is available to me in this subcontracting world. Um, I show up on time, you know, I'm in all my meetings. So why is it that just because someone woke up and decided, hey, we want a little, a little more control over these folks, uh, do I have to like, put my dog in daycare all day and, you know, let let my my basic necessities like kind of go by the wayside with no with no even it, I think it it wouldn't be much of a different conversation, but it, it's also just like there's no talk of like a raise for folks. We we heard from our subcontractor cognizant like, well, the company is just not doing well. And then we see they have an F1 car and we look up how much that costs. And it's just kind of like, come on now, like even if we were having this discussion, I think it would be different if you were offering us a a raise because at this point now we're just getting a pay cut and we haven't seen a raise with inflation. So that's another pay cut. And, um, they've threatened to move our work overseas. So it, it's, mm. it really just comes down to dignity. Like you don't respect us. And so we will force you to. <laughs> mm -hmm. You, you kind of laid out a few of the things that may be able to change now that you're unionized, but can you elaborate on that a bit? Like what can now, as unionized workers, you have rights to, and also what can you put your, like kind of, maybe not, I mean, maybe not prevent is the right word, but like there now will be obstacles in the way of being treated this or that way. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, I guess it might help just to explain our case and the hurdles <laughs> that are in front of us. Um, because we decided to file joint employer status, um, I guess we decided to do that because we understood very quickly that our subcontractor cognizant, if we wanted to negotiate over pay, they could say, well, that's actually set by Google, our client. Or if we wanted to negotiate over work from home, they could say, well, Google's worried about 
security of their information. So that's why you have to be in an office. So we kind of realized like they're just going to scapegoat each other if we don't get them both here. Um, but that that just creates a lot of delay and and barriers in the way of getting some of those benefits that you were speaking of. Um, Currently, Google is appealing the NLRB's ruling of joint employer status, so that will now go to the national board. Um, it's likely that they'll rule in our favor, like they can't make the evidence disappear, right? Um, so then they'll appeal it again, and it'll go to the Fifth Circuit, and they'll just keep appealing it. You know, it's probably, it, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but it will probably be a year before we even know who is our employer, right? Um, but once we get to that point, we would begin contract negotiations. And that's where we can really get some of those wins that you were like detailing. Um, everything is up for negotiation, pay, benefits, how promotions are handled, how, you know, sexual harassment and different issues in the workplace are handled. Um, at the moment, we could reach out to HR and they're, they hate us. I mean, they, they truly hate us. Like they treat us disrespectfully. They speak to us and like a really nasty tone. They don't take us seriously. Um, so we'll have a say in how these things are handled in our pay and our working conditions, like where we work from. Um, so pretty much everything, like the, the sky is the limit once we get to that point, but there are a lot of um, hurdles that we have to cross before we get there, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And as we know, a very significant number of companies, I wish I had the stat on top of my head, are violating the law on a regular basis to stop workers from exercising their right to unionize. But uh, Katie Marie, tell me this, if someone is watching this and they are somewhere in the alphabet universe and thinking we also would like to have more of a say on the job, uh, how do they find what's going on with the Alphabet Workers Union, CWA, Local 9009? Um, you can go straight to the Alphabet Workers Union website. It's alphabetworkers.org. Um, there's information there. Uh, we have a Calendly. You can set up a meeting with an organizer. Um, they'll sit down and hear about whatever issues you're facing and give you some guidance on where to begin. Um, there's trainings that you can attend for free through the website. Um, we have a code training uh, pretty much every weekend. Um, And in that training, you'll learn about labor history. Um, You'll learn how to have one-on-one conversations with your coworkers and kind of the basic strategy around getting to uh, a contract negotiation. So building out your organizing committee, having those one-on-one conversations, doing structure tests to see where people stand, getting cards signed, um, so there's a lot of free resources there and a lot of people who want to help. So that's a great place to start. Mm-hmm. Right on. Well, Katie Marie Marshner, member organizer for the Alphabet Workers Union. Congratulations to you on the victory. And thank you so much for joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the work that you guys are doing. Mm-hmm.